Am I on? There we go. Whew. Morning, Central Park folk. How are you this morning? We want to welcome you to worship, whether you're here in the sanctuary with us or catching us online. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time talking about the love of God for us lately, coming out of the uh, books of John, First John especially. And so I read these words from Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the Lord we come to worship today. This is the, the Lord we worship this week, this month, this year. It goes beyond when we're together in one place. Nothing separates us from the love of God, and we are charged to go share that love with others. So please rise, join us in song and worship to our Lord. see my victory when all I see is the mountain you see a mountain moved and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet. And I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you And if you are for me Who can be against me? For Jesus there's nothing Possible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the cross, God, you see. Stand against the power of our God. 
You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God, an almighty fortress. Oh, you go before us, and nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle, and nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, oh, you go before us. Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Lord of all. 
residing in us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. My name is Holly Scott, and I'm one of the elders here at Central Park, and uh, I am glad you're here. I want to go back. Um, well, first of all, it's almost May. Tomorrow, it's May. Can you even believe it? And May is a big month. And so we have um, graduations coming up. And this year we're um, looking to celebrate our graduates. And so for the month of May, there will be a basket in the gathering place where you can uh, write cards or leave cards or notes, encouragement for our graduates. Uh, check out the, um, the newsletter for a list of those that we have. And if you know of someone else, uh, please let us know so we can include them in our celebration. Uh, Memorial Day flowers. Uh, there are envelopes in the back where you can um, put your money for the flowers for as many as you would like to, to buy in memory of as many people as you would like to remember. And so we encourage you to do that. On May 28th, those flowers will decorate the sanctuary, and then they will be planted all around the church uh, for the summer. So we encourage you to uh, grab an envelope and remember some folks. I want to um, also point you in the newsletter. There's a little update from Haiti, and uh, I want to encourage you to think and to pray and to give. Uh, Haiti is in a very tough situation right now, and uh, the costs to feed our kids every day at school are huge, and we're basically out of food funds for the year, and they're not done with school, because they'll go through June. So, uh, yeah, so keep Haiti in your prayers and in your hearts. Then there's one other thing in the, the newsletter that I want to draw your attention to. Don't miss this. Um, the pastor's page is about church, church and mission. And our congregation is one of ten throughout the United States that is doing uh, this program together. We have cohorts all across the country, 
that are doing it with us. It's churches who desperately want to know how can we bless our community? How can we, in better ways, meet the needs of the people around us? You know, as we started this process, the, the, um, the newsletter also includes the names of the people on the team and stuff. As we started this process, it was so encouraging. It was so encouraging. We're, because in the neighborhood, we're the church that, that provides a great VBS every year. There's a super holiday shop here every year. There's a food pantry out front that feeds people every day. There's a great youth group that's going on here. And, and the kids are growing up into worship leaders. How awesome is that? There is so many good things. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And so we're excited about going and talking to people in the community. We're going to interview some of the people in the community and say, what more could we do? What would bless your family? What's a need that you see? And what are you excited about in our community, in the Central Park community? So it's going to be learning a lot about the people around us and figuring out what is God calling us to do and be in this place? So um, keep us in prayer as a, as a team and as a congregation and as a consistory as we seek to lead out in uh, what God wants us to be doing in this community. Okay, shifting gears. We're going to go back to to Romans as we come in prayer. Um, hear these words from Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. How many times do you come in prayer and you think, I don't know how to pray about this. I don't know what else to pray about this. And we think about our words. And today I want us to come to God and listen. Um, it's something I've been working harder at in my own devotions, in my own prayer life. So I want to encourage you as we, we walk through this prayer to cup your hands, and in those cupped hands, put whoever we're praying about or whatever situation we're praying about. And then we're just going to lift them up and love them. Don't try and fix them. We can't fix them. And God already knows what they need. So just lift them up in love and know that God loves them even more than we do. Okay? All right. Let's come before God in prayer. Abba, Father. Oh, you know our hearts so well. You know our weaknesses. You know our strengths. You know what makes our hearts beat fast. And you know what weighs us down. And so, Lord, we bring you ourselves, all of ourselves, Lord, there are so many situations that we've prayed about and we don't know what else to say. 
We don't know what needs to happen, but you do. And so, Lord, I lift up to you, we lift up to you, all the people that we know who are carrying heavy burdens right now, who are stuck in life. Lord, we lift up to you our congregation, our brothers and sisters in Christ in this place. And we pray for our congregation. Lord, we lift up the church worldwide. We lift up our brothers and sisters in so many places, places that we know and love, South Dakota, New Mexico, Haiti, the Middle East. India. Lord, we lift up our country. It's a mess, and you know. Lord, we lift up our country. And we thank you for the good and amazing people in so many places, in every community, who are doing good work. We ask that you bless their work. Holy Spirit, <clears throat> we call on you to pray through us, to speak to us, to lead us and guide us. Thank you for those promises of assurance that you know <coughs> and will bring all of our needs, all of our loved ones before the Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we have a chance to greet one another and uh, get a cup of coffee. Drop off an offering gift in one of the baskets in the front or back and just have some time to be together.
And we will rejoice as we lift his name. And this is the day that the Lord has made. So come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. And whether the sun will shine, whether the skies will rain, I know that you are good, and this is the day you made. Whether in life or death, whether in joy or pain, I know this truth remains, that this is the day you made. And this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. the Lord has made. So come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Now I can walk, and now I can walk in faith. You will protect my way. Your every work is good, and this is the day you made. And I am a child of are the one who saves and I am redeemed by love and this is the day you made and this is the day that the Lord has made we will rejoice as we lift his name and this is the day that the Lord has made Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. And this is the day, come and sing your praise, for the Lord now reigns on the throne of grace. Soon is the day. He will bring us home, and we have this hope, for we are His own. And this is the day, come and sing your praise, for the Lord now reigns on the throne of grace. And soon is the day He will bring and we have this hope, for we are His own. And this is the day, come and sing your praise, for the Lord now reigns on the throne of grace. And soon is the day He will bring us home. That the Lord has made, we will rejoice as we lift his name. And this is the day that the Lord has made. So come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice as we lift his name. And this is the day that the Lord has made. So come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. So come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Whether the skies will rain, 
And I know that you are good And this is the day you made Who else commands? And who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What are the beauty? What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God.
God, you are holy, you are set apart. We declare there is none like you. And we push aside all distractions, all idols, all things that get in the way that we may hear from you and hear your word and your truth this morning, that we be people of truth and love, seeking justice. Help us to walk in mercy. Jesus, in your name alone we pray, amen. You may be seated. Kids, you can head out to uh, Central Park Kids. Let's pray. Lord God, you are holy and you are mighty and you are powerful. And you love us and you invite us to call you Father. Who could imagine? Who could put those things together? What human could come up with those thoughts that would put us in a relationship with you of love? and compassion, or you would send your son into this world to die for us. Simply amazing. What you have done, what you have to share, what you invite us to proclaim. Lord, we give you thanks for servants of yours who in generations before have written down words of hope, of encouragement, of warning, and have shared them with us. We give you thanks for the way in which you have preserved your word through the ages in order that we might read it today. And I thank you for your Holy Spirit that enables us to see and to understand things that have been written long ago and to apply them to our hearts and our lives in this day, in this week, in this hour, and for this time. So Lord, open our minds and our hearts to the letters written by John to people he knew that needed to hear your words for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Paper and ink are a wonderful thing. Last time we visited with our, uh, grand, our daughter and granddaughter, I got a little card from Cora. <laughs> little uh, thing stuck on the front of it in the shape of a heart. On the inside it says, oh, I love six-year-olds in kindergarten. It says, I love you, love Cora written in her own handwriting in black letters, and every word is spelled correctly. Isn't that amazing? I love you. Love, Cora. We get little messages, little words that uh, get written on paper. <clears throat> and, of course, we have so many other means of, uh, of communication these days. We send texts to one another. We send emails. We send um, uh, instant messages. We send things on Twitter. There's so many places that we can, can use to, to convey our thoughts and uh, to share them with other people, to get messages to one another, but there's just something about uh, paper and ink. Being able to write something down in our own handwriting that conveys the thoughts and the message that we have for someone else. We have been walking uh, in January and February and now in April through the letters of John. 1 John is a letter that, uh, that John wrote, probably more of a sermon. It's not kind of your traditional letter where there's the greeting at the beginning and the signing off at the end. It's more just the content of a letter. Uh, perhaps it was a sermon that's been written down, but it was circulated among the churches in the area where John was. And then today we come to uh, letters uh, 2 John and 3 John, which are very distinctly letters that uh, were written to people. And it's amazing to think that uh, God uses letters uh, to convey the truth of Jesus Christ and also to share with people how they were to live as uh, the people of God in a particular time and place where they were. Um, over half of the books in the New Testament are letters that were written by Paul or Peter or, or John or Jude or others that uh, conveyed things that people needed to know. And it's amazing how God used those to, to share the good news in different ways and places and times. 
So the Apostle John, uh, as he's writing, he's in the, the city of Ephesus, and uh, one of the things that John does, he's sort of the elder statesman. He is the, the, the one disciple of Jesus who is still alive at this particular point in time. We're probably about 90 A.D., in the 80s or 90s A.D. It's been about 50 to 60 years since Jesus you know, died and rose again, and the church has spread uh, throughout this whole region, through all Asia Minor and Greece and Rome and, and uh, beyond that, Palestine, different areas uh, where the church has gone as the apostles have spread and as people who believe have gone to different places. And John is in the city of Ephesus. That's where he spends his last years. And he is a, a person there who shares the good news and who connects with other churches. Um, we have, uh, um, when we come to the book of Revelation, we discover that there are seven churches near Ephesus that John writes to uh, in, that, uh, in that letter. And uh, they, they form a nice little arc. And if you read in Revelation 2 and 3, if you go from Ephesus to the north, you go to Smyrna, Pergamum, and then back down. Uh, Thyatira, uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Uh, those are churches all in that, um, in that area of Ephesus. And it's kind of interesting if you see the, where the word Anatolia is there. You know, this, this region now today is Turkey. And where you see the word Anatolia, there's a city there where missionaries that we support, the Belgians, in, in Turkey have planted a church, another church in the city, of, um, the city that's in that region where that word Anatolia is. And so the gospel of Jesus Christ continues to spread in that region as well. But uh, those are churches that, that John knew. And one of the things that um, historians tell us was a part of John's life was that he was sort of a, a bishop or a leader for this particular area. There was a church historian writing in about 300 A.D. by the name of Eusebius. And uh, Eusebius uh, quotes from uh, a Clement of Alexandria who was writing and speaking um, around 150 A.D., and uh, here's what it says. Eusebius, and it was in a commentary that I read you know, just last week. It said, uh, Eusebius cites Clement of Alexandria saying that, quote, John used to go from Ephesus to the neighboring districts in some places to appoint bishops, in others to reconcile whole churches, and in others to ordain some of those who were pointed out by the Spirit. So while John was centered in Ephesus, he spread around to churches within that region to help them know the gospel of Jesus Christ, to, to deal with crises that came up, and also to, uh, to ordain those who are going to be leaders in those churches. So John has that relationship there. And as we look at the letters 2nd and 3rd John, we see this relationship lived out. Um, John has some things that he wants to convey to people who are around him. And this morning we wanted to kind of portray, to dramatically kind of portray that sense of words coming from one place and going to another. So I invite you this morning to picture John and his scribe uh, sitting down at a table and uh, beginning to pen a letter uh, that needed to be sent to a church, another congregation in the area, uh, that he wanted to share some of the things that were going on and uh, some encouragement to them. Um, First John, perhaps spread around that area as well. We're not exactly sure how that has, has moved around, but obviously it was held on to. Um, but picture Second John being written and uh, shared. Listen to these words. The Elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all those who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. 
Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. You notice that 2 John was written by the elder. <clears throat> we don't know exactly how John came to have that title, perhaps because he was the oldest of the uh, disciples of Jesus now left. Perhaps he was a very old man as he was going about his ministry in the city of Ephesus, and so they simply called him the elder. But he's the elder statesman among them, and so he is sending this letter. And he sends it to the, the chosen lady. Now, a little bit confusing for us. Uh, we think, okay, a lady, a person, but uh, probably he's meaning the church. In Greek, the word for church is a female noun. And so to call the church a lady would be a normal thing in, uh, in the Greek language. And so he's probably writing to another congregation. In fact, this is, we assume this is a letter that probably went to several congregations in his area. Maybe the, the churches uh, in the cities that uh, we put up on the screen just a moment ago. Um, and sharing some things that uh, need to be told to people. A couple of things that we notice from this letter. First of all, he calls upon them to walk in the truth. Um, he's very glad for people who are continuing to walk in the truth. And as we walk through 1 John, we, we saw the struggle that they're having with truth in the, in the particular church in Ephesus and the churches around them. That there are people who are claiming that Jesus was really not the Messiah, that he was not really human, that he really was not the Son of God come into this world. And we discovered the uh, last couple of weeks that, that it's so very important to know that Jesus is from God because he's an example of God's love for us. And he, by his death on the cross, by his blood that was shed, washed away our sins. And unless Jesus is the one who washes away our sins, then we have no salvation. There is no forgiveness of our sins and we have no hope if we do not have Jesus Christ as the one who was fully human and fully divine. And so, Jesus, or so John is warning the people who hear this to, to continue to walk in the truth. They need to continue to walk in the truth of, of who Jesus Christ is. And they are also called to walk in love. Did you notice that? It said it several times in there that we're called upon to, to walk in love. And uh, so there are to be people who are rebuilding the connections among them. There's been great tension in the church. Uh, people have left the church because they want to hold on to this other philosophy about uh, Jesus being merely human. And so there's been tension. There's been breaking up of people. And so now he's trying to rebuild a sense of love within this community. And so he's calling them to walk in love. Now these two things need to be held together all of the time. Uh, because it is very easy in love to just open the doors and to welcome everyone in. Say everyone may come in, everyone may be a part of things, um, and then to, uh, but or in truth to hold people out, to be very harsh in our truth, to say, no, this is what is true, this is what we need to do, and to, to push people off by it. 
we noticed uh, in this letter that um, John said to them, uh, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, you know, the teaching about who Jesus is, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. And so he is even discouraging them from having hospitality toward uh, those who, don't, who have the false teaching. He wants them to walk in the truth and to also walk in love at the very same time. And those two things continuously need to be held in tension. Uh, we can see very easily why John would say to people at this particular time that they need to be careful about uh, false teachers who are saying that Jesus isn't the Son of God, he's not the Messiah, and that they should not welcome those kind of teachers into their congregation. And I think today we would, we would recognize the same thing. Uh, as we walk through our lives as, as Christians today, there are some voices out in our world about who Jesus is that we should not be listening to or we should not be allowing to, to come and have a platform within the church or within a Bible study. If there's a voice that's saying that Jesus is only a good teacher, that he's not really divine, if we're saying that Jesus was not really human, that he's only divine, uh, that too is something that we shouldn't uh, be listening to. Or someone were to say, you know, Jesus is wonderful, but you need these works besides that, or you need this besides having Jesus. Jesus alone is not adequate. You need something else for your salvation. That would not be something we'd want to hear either. It's a very core principle that John is teaching here and says you need to, to not allow people who are teaching falsehoods to come and be a part of the church. But there's so many other things that we divide over these days that are perhaps matters of preference or they're matters of, um, of lesser importance um, in the Word of God, less central to the gospel message. And we wonder, what is it should we be splitting over or should we not be splitting over? It's something that, that comes in our minds. Um, this Just this past week, I read an article that was in Christianity Today. It was about uh, the Good News International Church in Kenya. And uh, come to find out, the, uh, the pastor of the Good News International Church, which about 10 years ago uh, had 1,000 members to it. Um, it's many, many less today uh, for one obvious reason. But the, in Kenya, they discovered that this pastor of the church, of the, uh, Good News, the, Inter the Good News International Church, was encouraging his people to fast until they nearly died because then they would get a vision of Jesus. And come to find out, there were 65 bodies buried in the, the property that he had. There were many people who were near death, um, and uh, they arrested this pastor. And another pastor, Zebulon uh, Y. Yezu, um, because they were um, calling people to, uh, to fast until they nearly died. Um, and also, come to find out, he was encouraging people to deed their property over to him before, he began, before they began their fast. And so obviously that is a church that no one should be listening to, of someone that should not be receiving hospitality. Sort of two opposite ends of the spectrum, um, illegal activity on one side and something core theologically on the other. But as the people of God, we always need to be walking in truth and in love, to finding those ways to listen carefully to what is being spoken, to know what is true and what is not, but also at the same time to be able to be people of love who are able to, to welcome, to encourage, and to support, and to love one another. It calls us to listen to the Holy Spirit as we walk along through life today as God calls us to be the people of God. Uh, one of the things that we notice in this particular letter is the great affection that John has for these people. You know, the chosen lady, the children, dear friends, brothers and sisters, all the terms used in this letter are terms of affection and connection. And uh, so that is the kind of body that we live in where that love can flourish. And so we listen carefully to words and we are able to, to show love to the people around us because of who God is and what he has done. But we, so we have that wonderful letter with that encouragement, a simple message that he shares with the churches. But as that message goes out, there's some people who don't want to hear it. And that becomes the occasion for the third letter of John. So if we would picture our... John and his scribe once again, um, coming and working one more time to, to write. Uh, there's another occasion, and uh, this uh, response is a bit different, so watch what takes place.
read it to the people. Thank you. The elder, my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. So as the letter of 2 John made its way from one church to another, it seems that there was a church leader who did not want to hear from John, did not want to share uh, the word of John with his people. Perhaps this was a group of people who had already left uh, because of their different philosophy about who Jesus was. Perhaps there was some other issue uh, between this leader and John. We do not know what the situation was. But he sent away uh, the words of John. Um, we want to... to to look in this letter at the three different people who make up the letter. Uh, we discover, first of all, the, uh, the, the, the church leader, Diotrephes, who um, pushed away the letter. Notice that uh, John has some pretty harsh words to speak of him. Uh, Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. Um, he is spreading malicious nonsense about us. He refuses to welcome other believers. He even stops those who wants to do so and puts them out of the church. He is using or referencing Diophanes here as a person who is not walking in the way of Christ, not showing love, not uh, being faithful as a leader within the church, not listening to the apostolic message and, and <clears throat> continuing to walk in truth as people need to be walking. And so he says, don't follow the example of Diotrephes. The reputation that he has in the church is now not good because he's leading his congregation astray. Then we have uh, the picture of uh, Demetrius. Demetrius is our carrier of the letter, we assume. He's the one who goes back and forth between John and uh, the churches to which he needs to bring the letters and brings the message of his rejection. And so John sends him with another letter, uh, Third John, in order to explain the situation to another church leader. We notice that Demetrius is very faithful in what he does. In fact, John has some, some wonderful things to say about Demetrius. <clears throat> It says of Demetrius, he's well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself, and we speak well of him. Um, so everyone who knows him knows he has, has a good reputation. Uh, just consider the situation to which he is putting himself. He has traveled a long ways uh, from where John is to where this congregation is. He has been rejected by the very people who are supposed to show him hospitality. Um, they don't have uh, the series of, uh, of uh, places to stay in that area. He was expecting to stay with Christians there. And Diophanes says, no, you may not stay here. And so he's putting his life in danger as he's bringing this letter from one church to another. But Demetrius is faithful as he carries the letters. And then there is Gaius, uh, who is the, the main um, recipient of this letter. This one is not addressed so much to the church as it is to this one person. And Gaius, too, has a reputation of, of being a person who uses his own resources to help other people. Uh, he's very faithful, he knows the truth, he walks in the truth, and he walks in love as he shares the good things that he has. 
And uh, so John is encouraging him to continue to do that, making him aware of what Diotrephes has done and uh, encouraging uh, Gaius to continue to walk faithfully in the truth. The question that this uh, particular passage, uh, this letter raises for us is what is our reputation? What is the reputation that we have to other believers around us? Are we seen as people who use the gifts that we have to, to help one another? Or are we like Diotrephes who... who enjoys the power that we have or the control that we have and holds others at arm's length so that they cannot experience uh, the, the, the life and the fellowship of the church as well. What is the reputation that we have? We're building a reputation one action at a time by the love that we share, by the, the truth that we hold on to. And so it calls us to examine the reputation that we might have. This letter also uh, challenges us in thinking about the way in which God's word has come to us. You know, if you read these words, we discover that there's some great challenge in the, the sharing of the gospel at this particular time and in being the church of Jesus Christ. That there's differences within congregations as to whether they're listening to the words of John or not. And, and John is the last of the apostles. We, we hold him up very highly. And he wrote the gospel and he wrote these letters and he wrote the book of Revelation. And, and all of these words come to us as the words of Christ but yet in the early church, they, there was tension. Are we going to listen to John or not listen to John anymore? The Holy Spirit did a powerful work to continue to shepherd along the, the church of Jesus Christ. At that particular time, there are some of the pieces of the New Testament beginning to circulate. Some of the letters that Paul has written, some of the Gospels have begun to move to different places, but not everyone has them, and no one has said yet, these are the official Gospels that contain the message of who Jesus is. These are official letters that we want everyone to read. No one has done that yet. That won't happen for another couple of hundred years before, the, before those letters be, are drawn together. So we are at a spot in time where they're beginning to think about we need leaders who are able to go to churches and say this is the truth and how we share it. And a little bit later on they'll have the church councils where they'll put together the creeds to say this is how we understand Jesus came into the world and, and who Jesus is. But that's still a couple of hundred years away in this early church where the gospel has spread into, into all of the Roman Empire. There, there are small groups of people, small groups of believers in different places there are different things that are going on. And for the Holy Spirit to guide and to direct the, the good news of Jesus Christ to come through that to us is simply amazing. We trust that God has been at work in that process of bringing to us the, the scriptures that we have and the leadership that we have and the, 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 the definitions of faith that we have in our creeds that we hold on to. And it gives us something solid to know this is who Jesus is and how we share him with our world. It also challenges us to draw together as the people of God, to be those that uh, demonstrate the same kind of hospitality that, uh, that John lifts up in this place, calling us to live together in love. I love how at the end of each letter he says, um, I have much more to write to you, but I don't want to do so with pen and ink or with paper and ink. Um, he says, I hope to see you soon and we can talk face to face. John used paper, he used ink to convey messages to people, but what he really wanted to do was talk with them face to face. He wanted to share with them the good news, he wanted to know how they're doing, he wanted to have conversations with them so they could live and work and walk together. I love how at the end of uh, 2 John, it says, uh, talk to you face to face so that our joy may be complete. I remember the very first message uh, from 1 John, uh, we ended at verse 4 of 1 John chapter 1 where it says, we write this to make our joy complete. And we decided that our joy there included the people who were reading these letters. That our joy uh, together is much greater than what we can have individually. Living the Christian life is not an individual life, it is a corporate life. It's something that we do together. And as John demonstrates, it's, a, it's an opportunity to draw together as a people of God, to worship, to praise Him, to, to learn from Him. And so as we walk through this week, we want to be sure that we're walking in love, walking in truth. That we're looking at what is the reputation that, that God is building in and through us and declaring to the world around us. And uh, seek to live in love as a people of God. Let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks uh, for these letters that have been written, for the way in which they have shared your power, your love, and your grace with your people. We pray, Lord, that as we live this out in this day and age, that we might demonstrate your love to the people around us. 
and that people might know who you are as we speak your truth in ways that people are able to hear. We thank you for words that were written down many centuries ago that are still alive for us today, and we pray that in all of these things you might receive the glory and the honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing, uh, they'll know we are Christians by our love. make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. Go in peace.